Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today's story is an emotional roller coaster about a husband uncovering his wife's betrayal and the explosive aftermath. I'm a 40-year-old man working as a finance manager at a local bank in a mid-sized town. My days are filled with numbers reports and managing a small team living in a community where people know each other. I've settled into a comfortable routine. My home is a modest house in a neighborhood filled with familiar faces. I find joy in small things. The laughter of friends during weekend get-togethers, the excitement in my children's eyes during family game nights, and the satisfaction of tending to my garden, the stability of my job, and the predictability of my life have brought a sense of contentment. Bills are paid on time. Vacations are planned well in advance, and every day follows a familiar pattern. While others might find this routine dull for me, it's a haven. It's a life built on hard work and consistent choices, reflecting values like responsibility, integrity, and dedication to family. Over the span of 15 years, our marriage was punctuated by important milestones. There were anniversaries celebrated with quiet dinners and surprise trips, the birth of our children, and the triumph of overcoming challenges like job changes and health scares. These events served as markers of our journey, each one, a testament to our life and the love we believed would endure. Our shared accomplishments were not just personal, but also professional. We cheered for each other's career advancements and supported each other through decisions like moving to our mid-sized town for my stable job. We took pride in small victories too, like paying off our first car, renovating our home, or planning a family vacation abroad. Our marriage was not without its trials. We faced financial pressures, disagreements over parenting, and the regular stresses of daily life, but every storm was weathered together hand in hand. Even when it seemed insurmountable, these trials were woven into the fabric of our relationship, each one strengthening our resolve and reinforcing our belief in one another. Despite the ups and downs, there was a profound sense of contentment. We had built something solid, something that felt unbreakable. We laughed together, cried together, and faced the world together. I held an unwavering belief that whatever lay ahead, we would conquer it together. Our love was tested time and time again, and we had always emerged stronger. Looking back at those years, everything seemed to click. Our dreams were coming true. Our love was growing, and the future looked bright. We believed in us, in what we had and what we could achieve. Over time, subtle shifts began to creep into our marriage. Once clear lines of communication seemed to blur, conversations that used to flow effortlessly became stilted. Smiles that came easily were replaced with blank stares. Arguments became more frequent. At first they were about trivial things like household chores or plans for the weekend, but gradually they became more intense and lingering, exposing underlying issues we had never faced before. A detachment grew between us, a widening gap that seemed impossible to bridge. I started feeling like a bystander in my marriage, watching as something precious slipped away. Even when we were together, her mind seemed far away. The dreams and plans we shared were replaced with a silence that was both deafening and confusing. My wife's job as a pharmaceutical rep had always been demanding, but now it seemed to consume her. The late night calls, the long trips away from home, and the constant stress started to take a toll on us both. I found myself growing uneasy about her frequent travels. Questions began to form in my mind. Why were there so many late night meetings? Why did she seem so distant? Even when she was home, I tried to understand to believe that this was just a phase that the woman I had married was still there behind the demands of her job and the strains of daily life. But doubts began to grow, feeding on the small changes and the growing unease. Something was off and though I couldn't put my finger on it, the feeling was impossible to shake off. My wife's job as a pharmaceutical rep was more than just a career to her. It was a calling. She had an uncanny ability to connect with clients to understand their needs and to represent her products with a genuine passion. Over the years, she climbed the ranks, becoming one of the top reps in her company. Her success was a source of pride for both of us, reflecting her hard work, intelligence, and dedication. Her role required frequent travel to different cities, meeting with healthcare providers, attending conferences, and networking events. 
The glamorous hotels and business dinners were part of her world. One that was exciting, but also demanding. Late nights, early flights, and the constant pressure to perform were all part of the package. Her phone was never off. Her email was never closed and her suitcase was always packed for the next trip. While I admired her success and celebrated her achievements, there was a part of me that was concerned about the toll her career was taking on our relationship. The long hours, the weekends away, the constant juggling of her professional and personal life. It all started to add up. I found myself missing the woman who used to put us first, who used to have time for our dreams and our life together. My pride in her accomplishments was tinged with a longing for the connection we once had. Her success was not the problem. It was the growing distance. The feeling that her job was not just a part of her life, but had become the entirety of her life. I couldn't shake the feeling that something had changed, that the balance we had once maintained so effortlessly had shifted. Her career was thriving, but at what cost to us? I tried to be supportive, to understand, but the doubts and fears lingered, hinting at something deeper, something that neither of us was willing to face. It was a Sunday like any other. With my wife away on another business trip, I decided to tackle some cleaning, something to keep my mind occupied and the loneliness at bay while rummaging through a drawer filled with forgotten gadgets and tangled cords. My fingers stumbled upon an old iPad. It was the one my wife used to use before upgrading to a newer model covered in dust. It screamed dull and lifeless. It seemed like a relic of another time. I decided to charge the old iPad. Maybe there were pictures on it. Memories of happier times, something to fill the silence of the empty house. The iPad charged. I sat down to explore its contents, expecting nothing more than a trip down memory lane. Well, what I got was something completely different. As I navigated through old photos and forgotten apps, a notification caught my eye, unopened messages, intrigued. I opened the messaging app and my heart stopped. Messages from two different men filled with words that tore through me like knives, intimate conversations, plans, explicit photos, secrets, all laid bare in cold digital text. The truth was unmistakable. My wife had cheated. I spent the rest of the night reeling lost in a haze of confusion and grief. How had this happened? How had I not seen it? How could the woman I loved, the woman I had built my life with betray me in this way? The following days were a blur of emotion and confusion. The evidence was there, undeniable, but confronting my wife, the woman I had loved and trusted for 15 years was a task I dreaded. I knew that I had to face her to demand answers, but how does one prepare for a conversation that will undoubtedly shatter everything? She returned from her business trip, weary, but smiling, unaware of what was about to hit her. Her cheerful greeting stuck in my throat as I faced her the iPad in hand with anger and disbelief. I asked her outright, showed her the messages, and watched her face turned from confusion to realization. And then to a desperate panic, she began to apologize, profusely tears streaming down her face, her words, a torrent of excuses, explanations, and pleas for forgiveness. She claimed it meant nothing that it was a mistake that she loved me. Still her words, once so comforting, didn't mean to me. Now her apologies seemed rehearsed. Her excuses feeble. She wanted to try marriage counseling to work things out, but I could only see the betrayal. I told her, no, my decision was final. I could not forget. I could not forgive the trust that had been the bedrock of our relationship was gone, destroyed by her actions. She continued to plead to beg. Even as I walked away, she was super desperate, but it was too late. The damage was done and there was no turning back. The decision was made, but the path ahead was fraught with complexity and emotional turmoil. I began the process of seeking legal counsel, navigating the labyrinthine legal system and facing the reality of disentangling our lives. The logistics were overwhelming, but the emotional toll was even greater. The divorce proceedings were painful and draining. There were assets to be divided agreements to be reached. And every step was a reminder of the betrayal and the love lost despite her pleas for reconciliation. My wife was compliant in the legal process. She wasn't seeking alimony and she seemed resigned to the divorce, even though her eyes still held a glimmer of hope. 
The day of the divorce hearing arrived a somber occasion that marked the end of a 15-year journey. In that courtroom, we faced each other, no longer husband and wife, but adversaries in a legal battle. My wife's plea for reconciliation persisted. Even there, her voice broke as she asked the judge for more time, a chance to save the marriage, but it was too late. The judge ordered us to split all assets. And my 15 years of marriage was over just like that. To this day, I still haven't told our kids who were in college that was agreed upon until they come home for break. About seven months after the divorce, we sold the house and split the equity, even at the closing. So many months after the divorce, my ex-wife was still trying to get back with me. I simply told her, no chance in hell that was happening. This happened 18 months ago. Our kids know now, and they wanted to know what happened. And I told them to say they were devastated was an understatement. We have a son and a daughter anyway, they are coping. And I want to thank everyone who has taken the time to read this. If this story gripped you, please like, comment, and subscribe for more incredible tales. Don't forget to hit the bell icon so you never miss an update. Until next time, stay safe. Hey everyone, welcome back to our channel. Today's story is a roller coaster of emotions as we dive into a shocking tale of betrayal discovered on Father's Day. I haven't done anything like this before, need to vent and get this out. I found out that my wife of 15 years was cheating on me. I found out on Father's Day. I couldn't believe it. I never saw it coming. We have two kids together. I, I am just trying to wrap my head around this and figure out what to do. She has a Zumba class she attends, and it's mostly women in that class. She told me one of her friends in the class has been going through a divorce, and she has been helping her out. I never gave it a second thought until I saw a post on Facebook from one of my wife's friends in the class that said, Happy Father's Day to all the great dads out there, and my wife was tagged in it. I clicked on her profile and saw that she was attending a Father's Day barbecue at her friend's house, and she never told me she was attending a barbecue. On Friday, I came home early from work and our boys were home. They are 18 and 16. My wife wasn't home. I asked them if they knew where their mother was and they said she left early in the morning and didn't know where she was. I tried calling her several times and she never answered. So, I decided to drive by the address that was on the post. And when I got there, I saw my wife's car with a bunch of other cars as well. I parked my car down the street and walked up. I could hear laughter coming from the backyard. I peeked over the fence and saw my wife sitting next to a man. I didn't recognize they were talking and laughing and having a good time. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. She was sort of flirting with this guy, but I didn't want to cause a scene and she was just talking. So, I decided to leave. I went home and waited for her to come home. A few hours later, she came home and I asked her where she was. And she told me she was at her friend's house, helping her out with the barbecue. I asked her why she didn't tell me she was going to a barbecue. And she said she didn't think it was a big deal and she didn't want to bother me. I told her that didn't make any sense. I indicated she knew I was getting off work early and we could have all gone to the barbecue, including the kids. She just shrugged it off and said she was sorry. And she would try to do better in the future. I didn't say anything else. I just let it go, but I was really upset about it. The next day, which was Father's Day, I woke up early and made breakfast for the kids. And my wife was still asleep. I woke her up and told her I made breakfast, and she got out of bed and came into the kitchen and kissed me on the cheek and said, Happy Father's Day. I said, Thank you. And she sat down at the table and we ate breakfast together. And then I opened my gifts I received from my boys and my wife. After I opened my gifts, my wife said she was going to take a shower and she went upstairs and I stayed downstairs with the kids. A little while later, I went upstairs to use the restroom. I heard the shower running. So, I went into our bedroom and I saw my wife's phone on the bed and I decided to look at it. I went through her text messages and saw that she was texting this guy. From the looks of it, it was not the guy she was sitting next to at the barbecue. It was someone else. They were making plans to meet up. I went into the restroom where she was taking a shower. I didn't say anything. Didn't confront her. I had to think what I was going to do. I mean, she went to the barbecue without her family. Right then and there. I decided that I needed to call a lawyer just to see what divorce would look like for me. 
I left the house and went to my brother's house and I told him what was going on. And he agreed that I should call a divorce attorney and possibly a private investigator. The next day, I called a divorce attorney and told him why I am considering divorce. He asked me a few questions and he told me to come in for a consultation. I went to the consultation and we talked about my options and he told me it might be a good idea to hire a private investigator as well. I told the attorney, my brother said the same thing. I told the attorney that I had suspicions. My wife might be cheating on me, but the only thing I had was text messages and her possibly meeting someone. The attorney simply told me that wasn't enough evidence. I needed more than just text messages. I needed concrete evidence like photos or video. The attorney asked me about the kids and I told him that I wanted full custody. He told me that would be very difficult to do, but it wasn't impossible. The attorney asked me if I was sure about this and I told him I was positive. I didn't want to stay in a marriage where my wife was cheating on me and I didn't want my kids to grow up in a broken home. The attorney told me he would draw up the paperwork. I stopped the attorney and told him, don't draw up the paperwork yet. I plan to get a private investigator, get more evidence. When I do, then you can file the paperwork. My attorney told me that was a good idea. After confirming with the attorney, I headed home. While I was driving home, I got a text message from my 18-year-old son. He wanted to know where I was. I told him I was on my way home. He said he wanted to tell me something. I told him I will be home in a few minutes. I will come back here soon and let you guys know what is going on. I am mentally exhausted right now. This story is called Update. My wife of 15 years was caught cheating on Father's Day, their previous story. Hey, everyone. I am back. Since my last post that day, when I left the attorney's office, I got a text from my son. He told me he saw his mother kissing a strange man while he was outside participating in soccer practice. I asked him, was he sure? He said, yes. My son said he saw a man and a woman get out of a car and he was sure it was his mother. The woman kissed the man, then got back in the car and left. I asked him what type of car he said, a white SUV. He said he didn't know who the man was. Then my son asked me what was going on. I simply told him I wasn't sure, but I will find out. After talking to my son, I decided to call a private investigator because I knew she would try to deny it or gaslight me and my son into thinking it was a mistake. I wanted to get proof. So, I would know for sure and could deal with it accordingly. I scheduled a meeting with the private investigator that day. When I met with the private investigator, I told him what I wanted. He told me it would take some time, but he would get the job done. When I got home that day, my son was already home. When I saw him, he had tears in his eyes. My youngest boy wasn't home. He was at a friend's house. My son even showed me a picture of the vehicle that his mother got out of. I immediately had him send a photo to me and I sent it to my private investigator. A few days later, the investigator called me and told me he found out who the man was. He also had video footage of them together. The private investigator showed me the video footage of my wife and the man she was cheating on me with. They were kissing in a park. Then they went to a hotel room. He had video footage of them going into the hotel room and then leaving a few hours later. After receiving the footage, I called my attorney and asked him, how does infidelity affect child custody fights? He told me it usually doesn't, but in some cases it can. He said, child custody battles are almost always in the best interest of the child or children. You're going to have to prove that your wife is an unfit mother to get full custody. Usually the courts award joint custody. My attorney also told me I could try to use the infidelity card as a way to get full custody, but he didn't think it would work because the courts don't generally look favorably on that. And it would be a long battle and it would be very expensive. After talking to my attorney, my private investigator calls me and sends me an urgent voicemail. He indicated that he wanted to meet me right away. We met at a Starbucks an hour later. The private investigator showed me footage of my wife having sex with this guy in this white SUV. I told the private investigator to go ahead and compile the footage for me so I can give it to my divorce attorney. Later that night, when I got home, my wife tells me our oldest son is ignoring her. After she told me that, I went to talk to our son. He told me he was mad at his mother and did not want to talk to her. 
I asked him why he said he was tired of her lying to us and he wanted to live with me. I told my son I would deal with it and not to worry about it. I told him not to say anything to his younger brother. A few days later, I received all the video footage from my private investigator. I watched it and it made me sick to my stomach. I couldn't believe my wife would do this to me and our family. Later that night, my wife asked me what was wrong with our son. I told her he is preoccupied with his soccer performance and wasn't really in a talkative mood. I asked her if she wanted to watch a movie. She said yes. So, we watched a movie. After the movie was over, I told my wife I had something to show her. I took her into our home office and I played the video footage of her cheating on me with this other man. My wife immediately started crying and she fell to the ground. She was in shock. I think I told her I have already filed for divorce and I was going to fight for full custody of our kids. Her whole attitude changed after I said that. She immediately became combative and threatening. She told me I would never see my kids again. And if I fought her for custody, she would make sure I would regret it. She was yelling and shouting. The kids came downstairs and asked what was wrong. I told them we were just having an argument and I asked them to go back upstairs. They did. After our big argument, I asked my wife to leave the house. She said she wasn't going anywhere. She told me she didn't have to go anywhere. This house belongs to her as well. After that night, over the next few days, I haven't talked to my wife. I sleep in the guest bedroom. I have moved all of my belongings to the guest bedroom and my boys don't really interact with their mother. Oh, a few people asked what does my wife do? She owns a flower shop with a friend of hers and I am a mortgage broker. So, I doubt I will get full custody of the kids. She is a good mother with the exception of her infidelity. My wife has hired a lawyer and she is threatening to fight me for full custody of our kids. As of right now, I have filed for divorce and waiting for her to be served and to deal with this child custody battle that will be next. If you found this story compelling, please like, comment, and subscribe for more incredible tales. Don't forget to hit the bell icon to stay updated with our latest videos. Until next time, stay s welcome to our channel. Today's story is titled, When Family Interference Ruins a Perfect Dinner. In this episode, we'll dive into a dramatic family gathering where a meticulously organized dinner turns into chaos due to some unexpected interference. I'm known in the family to be a control freak about preparing food. In fact, in my family, there are two dinners in the year that all members come, all 30 people. And before I took over, all dinners were extremely late. There was always some problem with seasoning or poor preparations. I'm organized and for every meal, I have a spreadsheet with everything I need to make a huge scale dinner. At first, they didn't respect it. Still, after seeing that my method was useful, everyone joined in and allowed me to be the head of the organization. Since then, dinners have been ready on time and everyone praises and repeats the dish. Not very common. It takes one to two days to prepare meals. I don't ask them to help me because I know I'm serious with organization. But if the person wants to, I ask them to respect the process. Another fact, my mother was a cook for one year and my sister-in-law is studying gastronomy. The situation, Sunday was the half yearly dinner and I was the head as usual, would help me, my sister-in-law, mother, aunt, and uncle. This would be sister-in-law's first family dinner and she offered to help. During the preparation, my mother started to do several things wrong. And every time I said something, she said something like, stay calm, a wrong thing will not lead to anything. The problem is that she did so much wrong, skipping so many necessary steps in the food that most things I had to redo or give it a second look. She continued to help even though I said it wasn't necessary. Finally, I broke down when I just commented something about the steps with my sister-in-law and she corrected me. I was going to comment, but my mother said, I think you better cool off in the pool and let those with experience sort it out. I accepted, grabbed a glass of wine, took the spreadsheet with me, and spent the whole day in the pool, ignoring when asked to return. So, dinner was late, poorly seasoned, undercooked, and no one had a second dish. My mother later said I ruined dinner and humiliated our family in front of relatives in revenge. I shouldn't take that seriously because it was just a silly family joke. 
By the way, I love making these dinners. And yes, my mother's and sister-in-law's behavior is common. Am I the idiot? Edit. Examples of what she did wrong. She put too much salt on one of the meats, which was inedible. There had to be 10 of something for the food and she cut it in half because it was too much. It wasn't. Also, she started to make rice very early and we used the pan first for other food and the rice was last because it was the biggest and heaviest pan. My spreadsheet basically has the amounts and how long each cooking ingredient goes. I pointed out that when they got the quantities wrong, too much or too little, or when they start making food that's for a long time before or after. Not the idiot. It's one of the more annoying things when someone wants you to take responsibility for a project, but insists that you do it in their style. It's especially irritating if your methods are your coping mechanisms and they systematically take away your coping mechanisms while demanding that you continue. And that's exactly what your mom did to you. I'm petty enough to love that you took the spreadsheet with you, too. I'm sitting here giggling, thinking about you in the pool like, you got this, right? Sure you do. Singing? Carry on my wayward mom. I'm chilling in the pool as you told me to. Problem? Anyone who says there's a problem is an idiot. I would go low contact with my family after this level of disrespect, but maybe Opie has a different idea of things. When people try to sabotage your work and then act like you're the problem, you got to draw boundaries and hold firm. Exactly. And how's this sister-in-law supposed to be a pro when it's her first dinner? I think the mom kicked Opie out of the kitchen because she was trying to impress her new daughter-in-law. Then when it went wrong, she blamed Opie instead of taking responsibility. So I have think that mom was low-key bullying Opie to impress her new guest. A wrong thing will not lead to anything. What? It leads to all sorts of things. I, I can only imagine how expensive that wasted food for 30 freaking people was. Mom was embarrassed by the control freak style and wanted to chill, but she also wanted the structure and skill and outcome of having the person there who does all the stuff well. She can't have both, and she was embarrassed by not having it work out. She doesn't seem used to the concept of follow through. Next time, tell people you don't want help in the future. Tell them you're happy to cook, but if you're cooking, you're doing it alone. Otherwise, everyone else can bring their own dish. I'm 29 female, a university professor slash researcher. My research focuses on maternity, law, and society. More recently, I've been diving deeper into how one of the repercussions of the child-free movement is the segregation of mothers. My family obviously knows what I do. My sister, 26, is getting married and is choosing to do a child-free wedding. Fine enough. She announced her choice to the family a few weeks ago. I said nothing. This weekend, a few cousins and close family members and I went out to brunch. My sister, out of the blue, asked me what my thoughts are about her child-free wedding. I said it was not the moment nor the place to talk about it. It was her wedding, and my studies are from a much broader point of view, not from an individual perspective. Nevertheless, she insists. She says she won't be upset, and now a few others want to hear what I have to say. Okay then. So, I explain that from my research, I've found that child-free community events like birthdays and weddings have a bigger impact on mothers. How child-free events often burden the mother, the ones expected to care for the child, to stay away from them, excluding not just children, but women from participating in the social life of the community they're a part of. So, how does this idea of having a day that's all yours, expecting your community to celebrate and support you, while excluding important members of any community, children, come from an individualist worldview while maintaining your expectations over your community? I did highlight again that my studies are not focused on one individual, but on the societal impacts of a changing dynamic in communities. I was more articulate than this, since I didn't have a word limit and answered a few questions that arose. However, my sister was quiet after that, and as soon as I noticed, I changed the subject, and everyone moved on to other topics. Well, Yesterday, my sister called me to tell me I was very rude to say what I said and that she was upset with me. I've been thinking about it and I'm conflicted. I know it could cause problems, so I refused to answer the first time, but she insisted and said that it would be fine. So, I don't know. Am I the idiot? Not the idiot. Was she fishing for a debate or an argument? She got the answer she asked for, knowing very well about what you research. 
Very well said, by the way. I've never seen child-free events from that perspective. You did everything right when giving your thoughts after being deliberately asked for them. I'm not sure what she expected, unless it was to validate her having a child-free wedding. It's weird that she would ask and reassure you she won't be upset and then call you rude. You not only warned her, but gave her the information in a very professional manner. I wouldn't have been upset if it were me. I would go ahead with my child-free wedding, but it would give me food for thought. Also, thank you. I appreciate this input on the societal aspect of child-free events. It's an angle I've never thought of before, and it's interesting. Your broad themes and conclusions make total sense. I can absolutely see how that would happen. Not limited to weddings, but I've seen this happen in one friend group, which really sucked for the mom in question. She was lonely, isolated, and doing an unfair share of parenting. Your position clearly not only has merit, but also has support garnered from a body of social science research. So, I wouldn't just dismiss it as unimportant or untrue. Certainly, it wasn't rude for you to share it. I, 29 female, just got married to Tom, 32 male, three weeks ago. I can't wait to spend the rest of my life with him. We just returned from our honeymoon in Japan a week later, and I got the wedding photos. My sister was a photographer since she has a business and wanted to gift us all the photos and videos. One of my bridesmaids, Hannah, 29 female, dad passed suddenly in a freak accident before the wedding. She has a necklace he bought her a few years ago, and she wanted to wear it on our wedding day, something she asked for on that day. Unfortunately, it didn't go with her dress at all, way too loud and long, and I thought it detracted from her dress. However, I didn't see this as a huge hill to die on, since I've read about editing wedding photos online and that it's a way for everyone to be happy. So, she wore it in the photos, and I asked my sister if she could do me a solid and edit two versions of the photo, one copy with the necklace in it for Hannah and one without the necklace in it for me. So, I ended up having that photo printed and put up in the dining room of me and all my bridesmaids. Tom and I threw a barbecue to thank everyone again for coming to the wedding. It was all going well until Hannah saw the edited photo without the necklace framed in on my wall. I, I explained and told her that I thought it was a nice way to compromise since I didn't say it didn't go with the outfit at the wedding. She wasn't happy and said that the necklace meant a lot to her and it was rude to have it edited out. I apologized, but pointed out that we gave her the photos where she was wearing a necklace and that I wanted my photo with my original vision on my wall. There are photos of her where she's wearing the necklace. It was just this one photo of all my bridesmaids and me in front of our venue that I had edited. All of the bridesmaids' dresses were handmade by me to match my theme and as a nice memento and part of their thanks for being in my bridal party. I would have designed hers differently if I knew she wanted to wear this necklace. She left pretty quickly after that and has refused to answer my calls or messages of me trying to apologize. Was this an idiot move? She still got to wear the necklace to the wedding and has photos of her in it also. But I wanted the outfits I made for my bridesmaids to be on show, not her dad's necklace. No idiots here. There's nothing wrong with you having an edited copy of the photo, but it was a little soon for your friend. Your friend's feelings are still raw. It felt like a jab to her. It wasn't. I know you know that. The other bridesmaids probably knew that, and your friend probably does too. But emotions are overwhelming. She just needs some time to go through grieving her father first. It was too soon, and that's not really anyone's fault. I'm sorry I wasn't as sensitive as I could have been. I got so lost in my own joy that I didn't stop thinking about how much you're grieving. I hope you can forgive me. Would you like to talk about your dad? Sometimes apologizing doesn't mean you've done something wrong. It's an acknowledgement that someone has been hurt and their emotions are all over the place. If it's an important friendship, swallowing pride and reaching out can go a long way. Weird scenario, but for the last two months, I, 28 female, and my husband, 31, lived on my sister-in-law's property. We have an RV parked beside our house, and we're using her electricity to run power. We have all of our meals with her, her husband, and her kids, and we also take showers indoors and do laundry. It is helping us out dramatically because we're able to save money for our home purchase. We couldn't save while we were in our rental. 
Now the agreement is that I do house chores, sweeping, mopping, dishes, caring for our dogs, their laundry if I feel like it, and alternating cooking days, helping with grocery shopping, roughly $600 a month because we all lead together, and pay her $150 for water and electric we're using. So around $750 a month, plus all our housework is done by me. My husband does all the yard work, mowing, weed whacking, insect spraying, garbage runs, and driveway maintenance as it's dirt and gets ruts. I'm currently 26 weeks pregnant as well. The point is, we do a lot. Sister-in-law, her husband, and her kids hardly ever lift a finger with us being here. Anyways, I'm currently not working. My husband owns his own business and is gone 40 to 50 hours a week and makes more than enough to provide all we need here, plus saving a significant amount for a house. He doesn't want me working while pregnant. I have hypertension, so I left my job three months ago. Well, lately, my sister-in-law's been sending me job alert after job alert, easily 8 to 10 plus a day. She's been dropping hints constantly. Every time we go anywhere, she'll be like, these guys are hiring, I can grab you an app. I always say no. I do not need to work right now as I'm contributing well beyond my means already and my husband doesn't want me working right now. So she drops it, but then continues to send me the alerts. Yesterday, I was kind of fed up because sister-in-law asked me to do a lot more yesterday and I was just exhausted. So I was cleaning, doing all their laundry and scrubbing walls because they had a party planned. And she sent over an alert for a cleaning position and I lost it. I responded with, okay, I will get a job, but that means you'll have no one to clean your dirty underwear and scrub your walls for you and I will not be doing anything but my portion of the chores around here. She responded, I'm just trying to help. There's no need to be nasty. My husband is on my side. Am I the idiot? Edit. We have talked about it. I thought the same thing, her being fed up with our arrangement. But my sister-in-law has clarified that she wants us here and doesn't even want us to buy a house to the point of her talking about converting her barn into an apartment for us and making big plans for it without actually getting a yes from us. She says this is her way of helping, sending me job alerts, because she feels that two people need a job because she's resentful of her husband for not working. Not the idiot. The last line is what this is all about. So her hubby is just sitting on his butt. Oh. She has a lot of anger. You guys need to move even if it's to a fan camp situation that has hookups. What does she expect to happen when you give birth? This situation is going to get worse. I'm not even talking about the job alerts. This isn't healthy. You guys need to get out of there. Of course sister-in-law wants you there. She'll lose her indentured servant if you leave. You've been there for two months and you already pay for a good chunk of their food, do most or all of their chores, pay your utilities, etc. This is ridiculous. They're using you to help them with their finances and housework. You have a high-risk pregnancy. None of this is good for you. Exactly. OP, for $750 a month, you can rent a spot for your RV, likely with extra accommodations that benefit you, instead of sister-in-law, without the headache of dogs, cats, kids, secondhand smoke, and her lazy butt husband. Look after the little one and your own well-being, mental and physical. You're not the idiot. I kind of feel sorry for sister-in-law. It sounds like she's projecting and maybe even mentally struggling, but you can be supportive from afar. My wife has a young teen daughter from her first marriage. She calls me by my first name as she has a very present and active dad. My wife and I also have a toddler daughter and an infant son. Originally, my daughter was calling me daddy, but recently she's been calling me by my first name. I let it go for a bit, but after a few months, it wasn't ending. I know it's innocent, and she's only doing it because her sister is. I don't make a big deal out of it. For example, if she says, can I please have some juice, Justin? I'll respond, daddy'll get you some juice. I've gently told her before that I'm dad or daddy. Her sister calls me by my first name because she already has a dad. I'm not offended by this at all. I get it's normal. I just want to correct it now before it becomes a habit and it never ends. Especially as we have a younger child who will soon learn how to talk. My wife thinks I'm overreacting and should just let her call me whatever she wishes. She claims if our kids called her by her first name, she wouldn't care, but they never have. 
So it's easy to say, I'm not on a power trip. I just think it's okay to want to be called dad. As long as I'm gently correcting her and not making a big deal, it shouldn't matter. The other night, my daughter asked for something using my first name. I said, dad will get it. And she corrected herself saying, oh yes, please daddy. My wife rolled her eyes and said I had broken her spirit. Was I wrong to gently correct her for this? It's completely innocent. I know someone else who had their own child and two older stepkids. Little ones are too young to understand familiar relationships fully. And she's likely just copying her big sister. Just gently correct her. Not the idiot. Your kid is just copying her big sister. She's not a teenager. She's a confused little kid. Your wife should call you daddy in her presence. So she knows. Your wife is an idiot. I get that it doesn't bother her, but it clearly bothers you. And I think out of respect for you, she should be encouraging your daughter to call you dad, not Justin. There are many ways to break a person's spirit, but reminding them gently to call you dad is not one of them. Why doesn't your wife have your back? How would she feel if the child started calling her by her first name instead of mommy? I bet she'd be hurt. If you enjoyed this story, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more intriguing family tales. Don't forget to hit the notification bell to stay updated with our latest content. Welcome to The Private Conversation, a mother's secret on our 10th anniversary. This is a story about betrayal and hidden motives revealed on a couple's milestone celebration. Brooke's 10th wedding anniversary turns into a shocking revelation when her mother asks to speak to her husband. Hello, guys. I'm here to tell you the story of my ex-husband, but let me get the introductions out. I am using fake names because, well, I don't want to be accidentally recognized. My name is Brooke, and the main people in the story are Sean, my husband, Camilla, my mother, and Melanie, who is Sean's childhood friend. Watch out for some drama, though. Sean isn't my husband anymore, and Melody turned out to be a homewrecker. Sean and I actually met through an uncle of mine named Andy. He was my mom's brother and a very reputable man in my city. It was through him that I met Sean. I was fresh out of college and Sean was employed at a company that my uncle's friend owned. We met at a party and quickly became friends. He seemed very curious about me when he first met me. He said, are you related to Andy by any chance? You look familiar, but I know he doesn't have a daughter. I have checked before. You are right. I'm not Andy's daughter, but I am related to him. He's my mom's brother. Oh. So you are the lucky girl who will get all of Andy's wealth. Gosh, I am so jealous of you. We have been dying to meet you, actually. Back then, I thought that his comment was somewhat weird and inappropriate, but I overlooked it thinking that it may have slipped out by mistake. I laughed it off and pretended like it wasn't a big deal. Yes, most people knew about my impending inheritance from Andy. He was unmarried and had no children, so he had willed it to me. I was staying close to him to learn everything from him. I had a job, but still helped around his estate. So when Sean mentioned knowing about my inheritance, it didn't strike me as odd. I should have been more careful, guys. I was young and fresh out of a bad breakup. Sean was actually a very respected man who was loved by the whole community near us. So I was also easily swayed by his sweet talk. The only problem I had with him was his childhood friend, Melanie. She was very rude to me and often interrupted our dates. When I talked to Sean about it, he said, Melanie is like that, Brooke. You know, she's my childhood best friend. We also work together, so we are super close. I understand that, Sean, but she is super rude to me. I think she likes you or something. It makes me super uncomfortable. Please tell her to stop interrupting our dates and being rude to me. Don't be so harsh on her, Brooke. She's single and lonely. She just wants to hang out with us. I can't change her behavior, but I will talk to her about it. Well, he never did because Melanie continued to be a pain in my butts. Sometimes she would get out of her way to be sweet to me, but most of the time she made fun of me and insulted me. Sean always told me to adjust with her. Guys, I tried, but Melanie hated me. It became much more apparent when me and Sean got married. Melanie said, just because you married him, that doesn't mean he is yours. I am and always will be his first priority. He'll always choose me over you. Melanie, I'm tired of being nice to you. 
if you're so determined to hate me, I will not put in the effort anymore. And you know what? I am Sean's wife, so I'll be his first priority from now on. Oh. We will see about that, Brooke. You better not get your hopes up. I'm saying this for your own good. Enjoy the marriage while it lasts. I was pissed at Melanie for saying these things. Sean and I were supposed to be madly in love. I was supposed to be his first priority, and I would be. That's what I always thought. Well, I was wrong. As soon as we got married, Sean started to spend a lot of time with Melanie. They were always hanging out together and never let me join in. I insisted and said, hey, Sean, we go out today. I feel bored at home. We can have a date night like before we married. It'll be perfect. I'll pass, Brooke. I'll be going out with Melanie. Don't wait for me. I'll have dinner with her. But it's been so long since we've had a date. Sean, we've been on two dates in the last three months. At least take me along with you. How can you be so selfish, Brooke? You're at the house. I can see you all the time. Melanie is alone and doesn't have anyone. She needs me more. I can't bring you along. She feels uncomfortable because of your hostility towards her. Yes, that's what my husband had to say about me. Readers, despite all the red flags, I stayed married to him for 10 freaking years. I don't know why I did it. By the end of two years, Sean was already checked out of the marriage. I begged and pleaded to go marriage counseling. I didn't want to be divorced, but Sean never listened. By the end of 10 years, I was slowly starting to realize that Sean might be playing me. So I decided to check his text with Melanie one day. I tried my best to get his passcode and snapped through his messages. This is what I found. I hate keeping our relationship secret, Sean. I hate Brooke and seeing you with her breaks me. How long do we have to put up with this act? Don't worry, Melanie. It's only a matter of time. Brooke's uncle is very sick, won't be alive for a long time. Once he dies, most of his assets will go to Brooke. That man loves my wife like his own daughter. But what does it have to do with us, Sean? I don't like to be your mistress. I want to marry you and have a family with you. I want that too, dear Melanie. I have plans for Brooke. I'm going to put my hands on her inheritance. Once she gets the money, I'll ask for a divorce. I'll say that she's a horrible wife and abuses me mentally. Everyone will believe me because they think I'm a good man. In the divorce, I'll get half of it. We'll have a great life with the money. Oh my God, this is your plan? I doubted you for nothing. You really think about our future a lot. I hope Brooke's uncle passed away soon. That which will lose everything at one go. Oh, he'll be hilarious. I can act like the childhood sweetheart who heals your broken heart. People call us the ultimate couple. The way they talked about me made my blood boil. I thought that finding proof of their cheating would break me inside, but it just made me super angry. I had my doubts about the two of them for a while, but Sean was manipulating me into thinking that I'm crazy. All these texts between them made me feel victorious. I have had enough of being manipulated and treated like crap. I was done. I quickly took screenshots of their texts and saved them on my phone. I then deleted those screenshots so that Sean doesn't suspect anything. Then I went straight to my mom for help. I knew that I didn't have the mental stability or patience to execute a solid plan for revenge. I needed my mom. I went to her place and showed her everything. She was shocked and said, I can't believe this, Brooke. Your husband really is a vile and disgusting person. I thought he was a good guy, but he's a freaking snake. I know, mom. Everyone thinks he's such a great guy. At this point, I'm not even sure anyone would be on my side if I leave him. You know what? You think he's cheating on you and using you for money, right? I'll bait him into revealing his true face. That way you can get rid of him and everyone will know what a piece of crap he is. That is a great idea, mom. He thinks he can get away with manipulating me. He has it all wrong. I will show him who he has messed with. He will regret this. That's my girl. Let's just go over the plan and make sure we don't miss anything. You will get this opportunity just once. We have to be careful. So me and mom went through all the details of our plan. I knew for a fact that Sean was cheating on me and using me for money, but I couldn't prove it in any way. But now I finally have a solid plan to catch him in the act. I decided to execute my plan at our 10th wedding anniversary. We had already planned a big celebration and everyone, including Melanie, would be there. It was my perfect chance to ruin them in front of everyone. 
The day of the anniversary came, and we were all having a good time. Sean was trying to sneak off with Melanie a couple of times, but someone or the other was interrupting him. Honestly, it was hilarious to see how hard he was trying to make a good impression on people by entertaining everyone. In a few minutes, everything will come crashing down around him. Just a little before we were due to cut our cake, my mom came up to Sean and said, Hey, Sean, I see that you're busy, but I was wondering if you could spare a few minutes for me. I really need to attend to the guests here. Can this wait, Camilla? I'm afraid I need to talk to you right now. It'll only take five minutes. Brooke can stay here and entertain the guests. All right, then let's go. I'm curious to know what you want to say. Sean and my mom left to go to the balcony. I knew for a fact that my mom was recording the conversation. It would be fun to see his reaction when mom baits him. I patiently waited while mingling with the guests. My friends had been briefed about the situation, so they knew what was coming. In a matter of minutes, Sean and my mom were back. When Sean was back, he looked really pissed. My mom also looked grim, but shot me a smirk when everyone was busy asking Sean what was wrong. Even Melanie said, Sean, why do you look so upset? Did Camilla say something to you? Today's your anniversary. You shouldn't be upset. Tell me what happens. Yeah, Melanie, I'm super upset. Everyone, I have an announcement to make. There will be no celebration today. The wedding and marriage is over. I'll be divorcing Brooke. What do you mean, Sean? I'm confused. We're having our 10th anniversary and you're asking for a divorce? That's ridiculous. Don't try to act naive, Brooke. You know I've been unhappy with you for a while now. You've been mooching off me and using me for money. I am done with your antics. I know that you have no inheritance and plan to live off on my income. I won't allow that. We are over. Oh my god. I had a feeling that Brooke is with you for money. I was honestly hoping that she turns out to be a good person. How could you do this, Brooke? You have been taking advantage of Sean. I'll support Sean in his decision. I've had my doubts for a while. Hearing the accusations at me really made me laugh out loud. Sean and Melanie's words had already shocked everyone. People who knew me had no doubts that something didn't add up. However, most of their friends and colleagues were eyeing me with disgust. Everyone around me looked super confused when I started to laugh. Even Sean and Melanie were eyeing me with suspicion. Sean said, Why the hell are you laughing, Brooke? This is ridiculous. Look at her, everyone. Look how shameless she is. Instead of defending herself or crying to have her husband back, she is laughing. This just shows how horrible Brooke truly is. Your words have made me laugh, Melanie. You and Sean do make a great team, to be honest. And why the hell would I cry to have my cheating and gold-digging husband back? I'm not that stupid. How dare you level such insane accusations against me? Everyone here knows how respectable I am. I work at a prestigious firm and have a great yes, yes. Why are you trying to ruin Sean's reputation? You're such a witch, Brooke. You want revenge against Sean for divorcing you? Oh, Melanie, I don't want revenge against Sean for trying to divorce me. In fact, I will happily give him a divorce if he asks for one. But I'll definitely take revenge for what the two of you have done to me. You think you are a reputable person, Sean? Then how will you explain these? At that point, I took my phone and started a beautiful slideshow that I had prepared for our anniversary. Yes, you guessed it right. I went with a classic presentation style to explore their affair. It had screenshots and images from security cameras in the house. The images shocked everyone. The things written in the screenshots of their texts angered them as well. Sean's boss also looked pissed because it was against company policy to date someone from the office. Sean and Brooke hurriedly started to accuse me of faking the texts and making them look bad. They were desperately trying to get everyone to listen to them. But I had some extra ammo up my sleeve. They said, all these are lies, people. Please don't believe this. Melanie and I are very good friends. She can't stand how close we are, so she's trying to spoil our images. Yes, all these screenshots are fake. She's definitely hired someone to fake them and make us look bad. Brooke, why are you trying to destroy our reputation? You are a monster. Oh, really? Melanie and Sean, you two think these screenshots are fake. Well, people, if any of you have these doubts in mind, you need to listen to Sean's own words. Then I signaled my mom to take out her phone and play the recording. Sean looked extremely pale and was just about to stop my mom from playing the recording. 
But my mom acted fast and played it before he could do anything. The recording played. Sean, there is something that I need to tell you about, Brooke. I've thought that it was important that you know. What is it, Camilla? Tell me now. You're wasting my time. It's about Brooke's inheritance from her uncle. You should have said that before. Is he dead already? When will we get the money? Well, that's the thing, Sean. My brother has changed his will. He will be leaving everything to another cousin. Brooke is pretty stable, so he's not giving her any money. What? Brooke is not getting the big inheritance. You can't be serious. You can't just tell me that I spent 10 years with that witch for nothing. How can you call my daughter a witch, Sean? She is your wife. You need to show her some respect. Don't you love her? Why would I love her, Camilla? Your daughter is a good-for-nothing woman. The only reason I married her was because I knew she had a huge inheritance coming. If I had known that Brooke won't ever be witch, I would have married Melanie long back. So, it is true your affair with Melanie. You've been cheating on Brooke. How could you do this to her? She loved you. Well, I don't care if she loves me. She's useless to me now. You know what, Camilla? I will show Brooke her place today. I'll tell everyone that I'm divorcing her, that she is a gold digger and has made my life hell. Your daughter deserves to be treated like the crap she is. Mom stopped the recording and let everyone come to terms with what they had just heard. I won't lie, guys. I did feel very hurt and embarrassed by the way Sean spoke about me. It felt that I was useless and incapable of being loved. But I held strong. I could see that Melanie and Sean were looking very pale and frightened. That was enough to remind me of something. I might not be successful in love, but I am not a pushover. I can make people suffer consequences for hurting me. After the recording was played, there was not much I had to do anyway. I had already started a chain reaction where everyone turned on Sean and Melanie. You see, we do live in an orthodox community where our daughter is taken very, very seriously. So things were not looking very good for them right now. People were beating them for their behavior and all of them stood in support for me. My friends added fuel to the fire by relaying all the way Sean neglected me in the marriage. It was the perfect day for me, the best anniversary I had with Sean, and it would be my last because I had one more surprise waiting for him. I said, now that everyone knows the truth, there's just one more thing I need to do. Sean, you don't have to file for divorce. I already did it. Here are the papers. You need to contact me through my lawyer. No, no, listen to me. We can work this out. You know, everyone here would want you to give me a second chance. We can't break marriages that easily. Melanie was just a small mistake. Trying to save your face, Sean. You think if you convince Brooke to forgive you, people will forget and forget everything, too. That will never happen, Sean. You had done wrong by my daughter. Now you will see what happens when you break your vows. There's no use begging, Sean. Your mistress, Melanie, won't be very pleased with it. My decision is final. We are getting a divorce. And just to be clear, I'm going to take half of your house in the divorce. Good luck trying to buy me out. Saying that, my mom and I left the venue. Sean was surrounded by an angry mob of people. Melanie started to scream at him for trying to abandon her and stay married to me. It was a whole shit show and we wanted no part of it. Two of my friends had left early to pack my stuff and send it to my mom's house. My lawyer assured me that I would get half of the house. So I didn't need to stay there anymore. I moved in with my mom and prepared for a divorce battle. Months passed and I was finally able to get a divorce from Sean. In our state, couples can get divorced after being separated for six months. Thankfully, we never had kids, so we didn't worry about that. Sean had to split the house with me since it was bought after our marriage. He was forced to sell his share because his savings were low after the house purchase. He had no way of buying me out. I actually bought the house from him with the money my mom gave me. I returned the money after I got my inheritance from my uncle. The inheritance did come free, but not before me and Sean got divorced. With great care, we were able to keep my uncle alive for a while longer. It was another slap in Sean's face since he wanted my uncle gone soon. Let's talk about Melanie next. Well, well, Sean did try to get back with me after I filed for divorce. He wanted to preserve what little image was left of him. Melanie hated it and proceeded to break up with him. Sean didn't care because they had other things to worry about. 
Shortly after we got divorced, their boss fired them from work. He was actually a good friend of my uncle and understood the situation. He kept Sean employed till the divorce so that he can't claim alimony from me. So Sean and Melanie have broken up and I have been fired from their jobs. Last I checked, Sean was planning to move to another state since no one liked him here anymore. Thanks for watching The Private Conversation, A Mother's Secret on Our 10th Anniversary. If you found this story gripping, please like, share, and subscribe for more real-life dramas.